Hey, what is up everybody? I am Jay Moss and today we are going to talk about how to mix horns. So let's dig in. Uh, recently we put out a video about how to use harmonic distortion to thicken up your mixes um, and the band I used for that happened to be a ska band. Uh, in the comments section on the J Moss recording Facebook page someone said can you do a video on how to mix horns and I said yes I can and so now I have to so now I'm gonna and this is me doing that. So like basically any instrument, horns really come down to the player. I always say like your snare tuning, your guitar strings, whatever it is you're doing, whatever it is you're using, it's not that they don't have an effect, they just have so much less effect than just the person who's playing and performing. A good player can pick up any instrument and make it sound good. One of the best drummers I know, hi Paul, uh, actually played a Pearl Export for so long and it didn't matter. I mean, he's so good, he can just bring that instrument to life. He did later go on to get a really great kit, which brought things up a little bit, and he just enjoyed playing more. But what it really came down to was the fact that he was so good. And that's what I'm saying, the player dictates. So that's gonna be really, really important when we're dealing with horns. Bad horn player, good luck. So moving forward, we're gonna operate under the assumption that our players are good. Um, in this case, our players are very good. Uh, this makes my life kinda easy, but there's still a bunch of stuff to consider. Sonically speaking, horns kind of have a tendency to get a little harsh. It is a vibrating piece of metal, so to some extent, you know, you'd kind of expect that. That is why I really like using ribbon mics. This one happens to be a Royer 121, and it's probably one of my favorite ribbon mics. What's cool about ribbon mics, and it's actually the same reason I use this mic on a lot of heavy guitars, is that the ribbon itself is kind of dark, and it attenuates those harsher frequencies that we find in I don't know, like using a JCM 800 guitar amp or recording some horns or anything that's just sort of like irritating, uh, this can be a big help. The other thing that's great about ribbon mics is that they um, typically EQ really well. So I can take this mic and I can gather my signal and then apply a pretty generous amount of EQ if I need to. And I feel pretty confident that it's still gonna sound really good in the mix. There won't be all these weird harmonic artifacts that I don't want. Um, so yeah, I recommend ribbons for horns. However, having said that, and having said a million times the gear matters, but not nearly as much as you think. It's about what's in between your ears. Good player, you can use any mic you want as long as you know what you're doing. There's mics I would choose over others. I wouldn't lean towards things that get really harsh, but to totally contradict myself, uh, I also use AKG C414s, which is like a total workhorse mic for me. Actually, let me go get one. I'm gonna go get a C414. Got one, I'm coming, I'm coming. Got one, here we go. Okay, what a crappy mic stand. This is an AKG C414, C414, depends, I don't know, people say it differently, but this is a total workhorse mic for me. Um, I'm a really big fan of this mic. I'll use it on anything. You just gotta know kind of the character and the voice of the mic that you're using. Because this mic has a bump around 3K area, you just have to know, like, that's gonna affect where you position the mic. That's gonna affect how you EQ the mic. Um, it's also maybe going to affect some of the settings you use on the other mic. I'm not gonna get into a whole, like, thing about this mic. The point is, if you know what you're doing, you can kinda use what you want. However, however, again, backtracking on my backtrack, backtrack, when it comes down to it, I'd probably reach for the ribbon first. So if you are gonna use a ribbon microphone, these are great at everything except one thing. They are not good at wind. A friend of mine actually blew out his Royer 121, put it in front of a kick drum, one big kick hit, the air comes rushing in, and it blew up his Royer and he had to get it repaired. It's a big pain. So you really wanna be careful. If you're gonna use a ribbon, use a pop filter. You need something to stop the flow of wind from just bashing this. Otherwise, you should be pretty safe. Every ribbon is gonna vary with its own tolerance, but um, this one's really good. However, you can definitely blow it up if you don't use a pop filter. I wouldn't take the chance. So like most microphones, the proximity to the instrument and where on the instrument you put this is going to be really important. I can't cover where to put every mic on every horn because every room sounds different. The way the room influences the sound has a big part of like where I decide to mic and so does the player. So my advice would be to experiment and it's not like, it's not rocket science, right? Like if here's your 
your source instrument, hello, hey, I'm a trumpet or whatever. What's cool about having a horn player is that you can say to them in real time, like, hey, can you move back? Hey, can you move that mic up a little bit for me? Or can you move it to the side? And then you can just be in the control room and listen to me like, oh, actually, I like it better here. Then I would recommend maybe taking little pieces of tape and putting them on the ground. That way your performer knows, okay, I stand here and I'm supposed to be about this far away from the mic. This is what we've decided is good. That actually kind of can't be overstated. And the reason for that is if you want a consistent sound uh, and your performer is moving like crazy, that's, I mean, that's gonna cause chaos. So it's not that your performer isn't allowed to move, but having those conversations first and sort of saying, hey, let's stay within this threshold um, will really help you get a consistent sound. That's just gonna make your files easier to work with once you get them into your recording software and start messing with them. And you won't have to worry about all of a sudden out of nowhere, it got really bassy or it got really roomy. So that's key, that's, uh, that's a bonus tip. Bonus tip. So I think that's kind of it for like pre-gaming, miking, setup, conversations, little tricks. Why don't we pop into the session and I'll show you what I did once I captured the audio information. Um, and I think there's some pretty cool tricks in there. One trick in particular, I think you'll be like, oh, damn, I probably would not have thought to have done that. Now maybe I will. This will be my gift to you. Happy birthday, Kwanzaa, something. Holidays. Okay, so let's dig into some horns. Uh, I made my horns purple. Dude, my control key is sticking, and that's what, if it looks like I'm doing this a lot, it's because I'm trying to zoom in, but it's being so lame. All right. All right, let's dig into some horns. Uh, these are all my horns. So I've got trombone, sax, and the trumpet. Awesome. So you could probably hear a little bit of bleed from the other horns when I played these in solo. Uh, the reason for that is we did track these live. So what I did is I put everybody in different corners of the live room and I used the polarity pattern of the microphones to give us some separation as well as I did some baffling with some thick studio blankets. Um, and that helped create more isolation as well. The little bit of bleed I do have really isn't a huge deal. As you can see, for the most part, these are pretty nicely isolated. Like there's a whole lot more trombone than there is sax or trumpet in that. Another thing you're gonna see right off the bat is that I compressed pretty hard. And now I have the luxury of having a lot of nice outboard compressors. So I was able to get the sound I want and do it on the way in. That just saves me from having to run stems or use plugins later. Um, it's something that I may not recommend you do unless you had some experience dealing with this instrument. Uh, the reason I compressed the rooms as much as I did is because they're gonna have to fight against typically a pretty dense mix. If this was horns in jazz or if this was horns i don't know in anything that wasn't as thick as like an actual you know hardcore punk rock whatever you want to call it mix then i think i would have used less compression but using nice compressors on the way in gave me a leg up uh getting these to sit in the mix the way i wanted them to uh, i'll show you here The mix is just dense. And in the ska parts, when the mix isn't as dense, uh, the compression actually helps because those are the times that I really want the horns to stand out. So typically speaking, when it's a punk part and we have a lot of heavy guitars, I'm trying to keep the horn sort of tucked into the mix. And conversely, in the ska parts, um, the horns are really the highlight. Yeah, sounds awesome. One thing I did use was Soothe. No shock there. Soothe is great for brass. I mean, this is probably a perfect moment to use this. You can see in the trombone, as it's a lower instrument, the fundamental here is more like 1K. Cool. And if we grab something like the trumpet, I bet we're gonna find that it's a little bit north of that. Hello, trumpet. Do 
you can see the trumpet's clearly living up here more in 4K, um, but it's a higher instrument, so that's to be expected. That's really the beauty of Soothe and the beauty of using multiband attenuation because it'll help you chill out some of the specific frequency issues. This is a way better thing to do than say, try to grab um, an EQ and pull this EQ up and then say, okay, there's that 1K fundamental. And this works, but it's just not as slick as grabbing something that's multiband and that's actually gonna listen to the source signal and actively figure out when to EQ. Um, so it'll EQ harder as it gets louder, which is exactly what I want. As the source instrument changes notes, so does the fundamental. So as that jumps around, As that jumps around, automatically, I'm just attenuating where I need to, and I can choose how much attenuation I want here. That's obviously terrible, um, but yeah, you just dial it in. Uh, the reason I don't have these running on the inserts over here is because I did the old F7 trick in Cubase, where I would say, take a region, and I did this to all the regions, and I would pull up Soothe in this particular case and I would set it to 4X and I would set it to ultra. This takes a minute to process, but it sounds way better, way less aliasing. It's totally worth doing. It's gonna go a long way to chilling out what can kind of be harsher frequencies that just might get irritating as you get closer to your final mix. All right, and here's a sneaky thing I did that uh, I bet a lot of people aren't doing to their horn tracks is I use this doubler plugin and I set it so that all the doubles are an octave down. And then I pushed those octaves way down below the dry signal. But this makes the horn sound way bigger, way fatter. So here's with and then without, and then we'll turn it back on. Okay, and now without. And then with again. I mean, obviously, how much more body do those have? This is this is great. You'll find me uh, doing sneaky stuff with uh, sub octave doubling all over the place. I think I'm gonna do a video on a guitar trick I use a lot pretty soon. So this is on all the horns, and this is a, a stereo plugin, so it's doing them all at once. Um, try it out. I it's pretty cool. And then, kind of lastly, to also make the horns feel big, um, I used uh, this is probably one of my favorite reverb plugins. The room is really good. I use this reverb plugin to help me increase the space and the size of the horns as well. I'll show you this part too, uh, with and then without and with. Okay, and then this is without. Kind of boring. And then here's with one more time. Boom. I mean, so that's kind of horns. I I don't do any bus compression. You could, you totally could. Um, but the reason I didn't do any bus compression is because I did such aggressive compression on the way in. I use distressors for these, um, but I think I use distressors and I also use fatsos depending on the instrument. If you aren't as confident grabbing this much compression on the way in, just record them dry. And then uh, go ahead and just like grab a distressor plugin. Uh, just to kind of exemplify what I would do um, say on a trumpet with a distressor. And we'll just pretend this is a real distressor. Sounds good. I'll probably go three to one. I don't want to be too heavy handed um, on my ratio. Uh, because this is a higher range instrument, I don't have to worry about high passing the detector. On the analog version, I absolutely turn on distortion to um, anything to warm up something that's this sort of sharp. On Distressors, five and five is always a really great starting point. Um, depending on the pace of the song, like for this, because it's pretty fast, you might want to go with a slightly faster release. Yeah, that sounds a little better. Typically, with like all these little short notes, it's better to speed up your release a little bit. So, as opposed to... See how this is just not letting go? 
Um, let's go back down to three. You can see the attenuation is reacting more musically, like more in time. Um, so experiment with this. Uh, this is actually, I know I talk about distressors a lot, but like this is actually a great plugin for you to use on horns because it is inherently a little dark. It's inherently a little warm. And that's what we're fighting for when we're mixing horns. We're fighting for them to not be sharp and irritating. We want them to be smooth and kind of creamy and big. And particularly with things like a trumpet, that might take a little work. Um, so the combination of warmer compression plus um, high mid-range attenuation, hopefully dynamic. You could do it with a multiband compressor. If you have Soothe, you could totally do that. Your worst case scenario is that you might just find yourself EQing somewhere in that frequency range. If you do have to just use a normal EQ, bring up something that has a spectral analyzer so that you can kind of find the fundamental and start your work from there. Yeah, as, as expected, that trumpet, the annoying parts around 4K. 4K in general is just sort of annoying, so uh, it's a trouble area. Cool. All right, I mean, that's kind of it, guys. Like, make sure you get your performance right. Make sure you get your dynamics right. Um, I did do some editing. You can see, let me put this into bars and beats. You can see that I cleaned up some of the editing here. Because there was cross-instrument bleed, I wasn't able to edit as heavily as I wanted to, but... Um, I could nudge things enough so that it just sounded tighter. So it's about bigness too. We double tracked everything here. To recap, on top of that, I added two sub octave layers and they make a world of difference. So uh, experiment, try things out, shoot for even dynamics, shoot for them to sound creamy, warm, and big. Then just move the group fader to get them to sit in the mix right. You might find yourself having to do a little bit of volume automation part to part, but uh, just have fun with it. Hey, it's a it's all